Hey, this is Scott Colwell from Partner IT. Today showing just how easy it is to make a service in DWPA. And jumping right in, let's take a look at what we'll be creating today. Uh, a very simple software install service. We're just requesting for a software install. We can see we're grabbing the user's name, a bit of information about their computer, what software package they want, and a business justification. Didn't say it was a good one. And when you click the service request, we can notice a few things about this service. Uh, for one, we're waiting on an approval. So we dip in, we see that we're waiting for an approval. So this service does have approvals. And of course that leverages the approval engine in, in your remedy system. And once it's approved, we see that it is approved and also that a work order is created inside your remedy system. So we've got a fulfillment record working and this request is just going to sit there and wait until someone actually works the request. And once that request is complete, DWPA knows that the service has been completed and we inform the user. And that's what we're building. So jumping right into DWPA and getting started with creating a new service, uh, naming it it's something different, new, e.g and picking our template and our catalog and just setting a very simple profile. I'm just grabbing a logo there, setting our excerpt and our description. And I'm going to get lazy about the description and just copy and paste the excerpt. I really want to focus on the workflow and the questions. And good enough for demonstration purposes. So jumping into workflow, uh, the first thing we need to add is a workflow item. So we'll add that and create some new workflow. I typically name mine the same as I do my service just to make things easy on myself. And then you pick a catalog and I keep that the same as my service catalog and create. And in our workflow palette. I'm going to make this very simple. This service for now does nothing. It goes from start to finish. And as a result, you know, your services will just be complete, but that's okay. We'll get back to this and make it do something, but we're going to add some variables that we need to store. So we know we are going to add a context variable and that is of type uh, service broker context that gives us all kinds of goodies, uh, such as the, the request ID, the context, the service name, who's making the request, just a plethora of goodies that we can use later as data for our service. Going through and adding our other variables that we need, such as our user's ID, and uh, most of this stuff is just text, so we can speed things up a little bit here. Now, just to take a look, you know, we, we didn't have one piece of text, one's the version. Do they want standard or professional? So we're going to make this variable, variable type a, uh, a selection and we'll give them two options to select. One will be standard and the other of course will be professional. And we just need one more variable and that's to hold their business justification. And that's good with our variables in place. We can actually just save this workflow as it is and hop right into questions and start designing the actual user interface for the, uh, the, the request. And creating our questions. If you haven't seen this, you drag a one of your variables that we just created in the workflow over to the palette. And in the case of user ID, you know, we know who this person is already is the person creating the, the request. And I can pull that over from my service request context. I can give them a default value for login name. And I can also add computer ID, make that a text field, same as before. And here's we're going to hit a snafu here. We don't have a default value for computer name. It's not part of the service context variable. We can't just add in a default value. The same thing with service or serial number. 
So we're gonna have to find a different way to get this stuff done. Now adding in our uh, selection criteria, the, the selection type, our version, we see that we get some uh, options there. We get a, so I'm gonna pick radio button just to make that nice and easy for the user. And when I add my business reason, I'm gonna give them a bigger area to type in than just a text box. I'm gonna give them a text field to type in. And for this service, we're just making everything required at the question level. So we're doing pretty good. We've got everything laid out, but we still have computer ID and serial number. Uh, we don't have defaults for those guys. So we're gonna have to handle that using a, an action. And an action uh, uh, just retrieves really data from your remedy system as is the heart and soul of it. So I'm gonna name this uh, get computer info. And the trigger, if you're thinking like a, an active link, open questionnaire is almost like the onload event or the display event. And the trigger conditions act as a run if. And I only want to run this action if the computer ID is null. And that way if they do type in a computer ID or if one's already there, we aren't going to repeat some, some workflow steps here. Now adding a form, when we click add form, it's going to display all of your remedy forms. You can use any data from your remedy system. In our case, we're heading right over to asset where the person joins with assets. And I'm looking for where the login name is, who's ever making this request. And their item is, is either a laptop or a desktop. We're just honing in on the user's computer. And once we have all that in play and we retrieve a record from the AST form, the asset form, I just need to map that into my service. I'm gonna map the name over to the computer ID and I'm mapping the service, the serial number over to serial number on my form. And we're all set. We've got an action in play. Now computer ID and service number will have default values set. So the user doesn't have to know because that's typically information the user doesn't know. And I'm going to give this uh, questionnaire a little name. Again, the same as my service name. And now we can actually hop back in the workflow and make this do something. So far, we've just set some variables and we've got it uh, going from start to end. So the first thing we want to do is, is get an approval in play. And we can do that with call activity. Set the process over to request approval. And just fill in a couple variables here. So we're requesting it for the user. And we are pulling that from that context variable that we uh, declared earlier. Again, a bevy of information coming through. The approval summary is what the approver will see in either their email or, or their notification. So we're just, you know, please allow whomever is, is requesting this uh, to have this loaded on their, their system. And we have to supply this, the service name and we can get that again from service, our context variable, and our request ID again from the context variable. Now there's a couple things that can happen from a request. It can either uh, be approved, it can be rejected, or uh, somewhere along the line we can get an error. So we need to account for all those transitions. And to do that we, uh, we just drop in one of these uh, exclusive gateways that can be thought of like an if-then-else statement. So let's trap this error first, right? So I'm going to say if the return value from our call activity step is error, we're just dropping right down to that uh, error and we're going to end things. Now, if it's successful, we're going to create a work order. And again, I'm going to set the status if it equals approved. And we're going to get right in there and create a work order. And after we create the work order, uh, I'd also like to maybe drop a little note in with our request saying what that work order number is, just for easy reference. And rename that step. Wire everything up right to the end and we're in good shape here. Now I'm just going to set some of the variables for the work order and there's not many you need to set, but you need to set the, uh, the login name. We need to know who's making this request. 
and we need to know the connection, so we're connecting to our remedy system to make this work order. Scrolling on down a little bit, we're going to set the summary and we're going to set the description to something too, so that it's a little bit more descriptive when the when the help desk reads it. And again, a lot of this information being pulled from our context variable, but we can also include data from our uh, from our questions too. So once the user makes their answer, we can include that in our work order so we can provide their business justification here as part of the description. And last, we just need to provide a context of process and context variable so that the system knows how to coordinate things. So we get that goodness where when they close the work order, it closes the service in DWP. And here we can just set a little message to the user that we've created the work order. And again, from that output step from creating the work order, we can grab the work order ID and use that as some information in our own service. We're all set. We're all set. That's going to create our work order. That creates a little notification to the user and we're all done. The only thing to account for now is what happens if there's a rejection. And if there's a rejection, I'm just going to let the user know that there's a rejection. Uh, so again, I will set the, the, the request ID to this request ID and just drop my little message, you got denied. And I don't need any, uh, any if condition on that exclusive gate. I'm already trapping for errors and successes, so the only thing left is a, a denial. And then I'm going to set the status of this request to cancelled. So if the, the approver re rejects this request, we'll cancel the, uh, we'll cancel the request out. And that's our workflow. Very simple, very succinct, easy to do. Uh, but does a lot for us. So saving everything and we want to get this into DWP. So one last step, we're, we need to knock this out of draft and get it into approve and publish and publish this to DWP. And we see our service is now one of the list of the many services and we can check out the fruits of our labor here. So we'll switch over to DWP and we'll just do a little search for our service, our EG software. And the icon stands out a little bit so we're easy to see and uh, we'll just give that a click and we can see our service excerpt. And I just want to request that now and take a look at what we've created. So again, I see our default values coming through. I see Alan's coming through. I see Alan's laptop. I see that what his serial number is being populated from those actions. I see our uh, selection radio buttons coming through. We can make a little selection there and set our, our business, uh, uh, business case. And when I submit that, I wait for the results here and I can see we're waiting to approve. So I dive into that service and I check out some of the what we've created so far. We're waiting for an approval. So far nothing else in the system has happened. So once it gets approved and I approved it off camera here. Great now so this request is approved. And I'll scroll down a little bit and we can see we've, we've popped in our message with the work order number. And I can actually see this in Smart IT. So if I pop over to Smart IT as a uh, fulfiller role, I'm just going to work this ticket, pretend I installed the software, set the, the ticket to complete. And now when I go back into DWP, as far as the user's concerned, this request is completed. And I'm gonna say he's happy. And I'm pretty happy. We just created something inside of 15 minutes. 
Thanks for watching. Appreciate your time. And we'll catch you in the next video.